Let's turn over to 2 Peter chapter 2 this morning. We've been going through 1 and 2 Peter. And if you're new to the church, we just take a book at a time and just go through it. Uh, and let it breathe and, and the Lord ministers well to us. We've been doing this for 12 years. But in 1 Peter, he deals with walking orderly and submitting to the authority that God has put over your life and not being like the world that is full of rebellion, but submitting to the Lordship of Christ, being a good uh, citizen and civilian, uh, being a good being submitted in your home, being submitted in your workplace, being submitted in the church. And in 2 Peter, he really deals with being submitted to the Word of God, submitting your life to the Word of God. Y'all are dismissed. God bless you, junior high. God bless y'all. No, let them stay. Everybody back in. All right. And last week we talked about uh, Peter saying, look, you may think that you have a big experience that, that with God that's so big that you don't have to listen to the apostles and you don't have to read your Bible. He says, but if you think you've had a big, big experience that was, uh, that was with God, I've had a bigger experience. He said, we were eyewitnesses and we beheld his glory on the holy mountain. And so a lot of people, they get experiences in the church and they say, this is my truth, you know, and I don't have to believe the Bible or I don't have to listen to all that it has to say or it's boring. And what we really need is those experiences. And I love experiences, but if you just live for experiences, you're going to have some bad ones too. And you need to know God through what you read in the Bible. It's an overall testimony that frames your life. Amen. So there's mountaintops and there's valleys. And you need God to be in both. Whether you're having a good time or a bad time or whatever time you're having, whatever season you're in. And Peter says, we're speaking from a place of authority as apostles. We had eyewitness accounts of Christ. We spent three and a half years eating with him. Could you imagine having one meal with Christ? The questions you would ask him today. Peter says, we spent three and a half years with him. And then when he was raised from the dead, we spent 40 days with the risen Savior. And so a little child may have some experiences up to the age of three or so. But there's a reason that Peter is a father in the faith because his experience is way more than yours. And he's able to speak with greater authority because he was an eyewitness of Christ and his glory. And then he point, Peter says, not only that, but there's even a more sure word than even our eyewitness account. And that comes from the prophets. And they prophesied of the coming of Messiah. And so our experience is confirmed by their prophecies. And he gives this word picture in Matthew chapter 17 where Peter, James, and John go up the mountaintop with Jesus. And before him, Jesus, before them, Jesus is transfigured. And the Bible says in the mouths of two or three witnesses, every word is established. And you have Moses and Elijah that show up, which are the Old Testament prophets or representatives of them. You have Peter, James, and John who are the New Testament apostles. And everyone's bearing witness of God the Father glorifying His Son. A voice comes from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear Him. What a word picture that God gives us of testimony of scriptural authority. These eyewitnesses, these people that testify to Christ. And Peter is at the end of his life and he's about to, he says, I'm, I, I've been told by the Lord that my time is at hand. I'm going to wrap up this tent. He calls his body a tent. He says, and I'm going to make an exodus swiftly. He uses the word S exodus to describe his departure because it's going to be awesome when he dies. But he says, 
I know that there are going to be people that are going to come in to the church to try to hijack the church when I'm gone. And they're going to use their own opinions and their own experiences. And they're not going to measure it by what has been written and said in the word of God. And he says, therefore, you need to know your salvation. He deals with this in the first chapter. You need to know what sanctification looks like. You need to know what mature Christians look like. And you need to know your scripture in order to identify and withstand false teachers who are coming into the church. You need to know the difference between the genuine and the counterfeit. I was talking to Lori last night. She said that when you're hired at a bank as a teller, all you do is count money the first few days, just all the time. You learn how to handle the real so that by touch, you know the fake when it comes through. There are a lot of Christians who have not handled the word of God. They don't spend time in the word of God and the wolves pull over their eyes. Because people are merciful. People are pushovers a lot of times. And people with agendas come into the church to derail. Subtly, they come in to derail the church and pull them away from the truth of Scripture. And that is what Peter is going to deal with in this chapter. He's going to identify and expose false teachers. False teachers. Pseudo didaskalos. They're pseudo they're not real. They're false. They're fakers. They have motives that are impure. They're unclean. And they're prominent in the church. The way I was raised, you didn't talk about the pastor. You didn't talk bad about any leadership. You honored them, and I still carry that today. I, I think it's very important we honor those that labor in the Word. And the Bible's clear about that. And there are some people that they're always just calling out everybody, throwing stones. Um, but to a certain extent, we were never taught how to identify false teachers and to avoid them and not to connect our lives to them. And Jesus said there are many that are going to destruction through a broad way that false teachers have paved. And so, guys, I don't, necessarily like this chapter in my flesh very much that I'm going to give you today. But I know it's good medicine and it's profitable to you, especially with this American Christianity that we have that preaches fair weather Christianity to fair weather friends of God. God is looking for some salty dogs. He's looking for some loyal people. Gold tested by fire is what he wants out of his church. And a lot of you are. But we're moving into a season where it's a pluralistic world of truth. Where your experience is your truth. And Peter's saying, no, 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 no. It all going to be measured by the word of God. And what you do with Jesus and what he does with you. And these are very popular teachers, he's going to say. Everybody speaks well of them. Why? Because they tell you exactly what you want to hear. They stroke your pride. They preach peace when there is no peace. They preach a God who's a gummy bear. Only here to make you feel entertained. And it's like an opiate for the masses. But it's not something that sobers you up and causes you to live with discretion. And therefore you fall for it thinking you're smart, but you've not handled the word of God enough to know the real from the fake. So we're going to deal with that today. And I want to say everybody in this room is a sinner and we all struggle, but there are some that come to full maturity in sin. Or they let their little spiritual melanoma metastasize and don't put it in check. How many of you know you got to put your sin in check? And it needs to be accountable and it needs to be exposed to light repeatedly. Glory to God. Or you will allow that thing to get to a point where you've justified your behavior and now you're brazen in it. And now you're teaching things to justify your lifestyle that are derailing people who are looking to you. Peter has no patience for these people. And I want you to 
hear him today because he speaks the truth. These are not my words, they're his. So let's look today at 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. Lord, say what you want to say today, God. Help me to get out of the way and open hearts, Lord God, and let us walk out of here wiser than we came in. I pray in Jesus' name. Above all, Lord, let, me be, let us be good business for you. Amen. So he says, but... And he makes distinction between the eyewitnesses and the prophets and the Holy Scripture and these guys. But there were also false prophets among the people. He's going to speak here to characteristics of these false prophets. Number one, their sphere of influence. And it says they were among the people. They did not come from the outside. They were already inside the church. They're already inside the church. And this is speaking about, when it says among the people, it's speaking about Israel in the Old Testament. Yeah. These were false prophets who were among the people. And as they were, so there will be false teachers. There will be false teachers. Peter says, this isn't going away. Some people might think, well, we're the church and this doesn't happen anymore. Everybody loves Jesus. Everybody's happy. Everybody wants to do right. Everybody... Is a good cowboy for Jesus. Good old boys. Burgers and fries. For Jesus. And he says, no, there's always been this kind of deal going on and it continues. And there will be. There were false prophets in the Old Testament. There'll be false prophets and teachers right now. Until the Lord returns, there's always going to be the fake and the real. Okay, And the word false prophet is introduced into the New Testament by Jesus. He says, beware of these pseudo prophets, these false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. And he says this in Matthew seven fifteen through 20. And then he goes on to say, and on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not do signs and wonders in your name? And did we not cast out devils in your name? And he will say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity and lawlessness. I never knew you. Like two ships passing in the night, we never had intimacy. He uses the word never. About these guys who come in like, like sheep, but they're really wolves. He says, many will say to me on that day, not few. It's a broad world. And these are people that use the name of Jesus, you guys. Isn't that exciting? Matthew 24, 11 through 13, Jesus says, Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. He says again in Matthew 24, 24, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Luke 6, 26, woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so they did, so did their fathers to the false prophets. Acts 13, 6, there was a man named Elymas who was a false prophet who withstood Paul and Barnabas, and he was also called a sorcerer, manipulator. 
1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So John says, don't be gullible. Again, the book of James, the book of 1 John, the book of 2 Peter, the book of Jude, those books are dedicated to what a Christian should look like. What a real Christian is versus what is fake. Okay? If you ever want to know what a Christian should look like, go to those books and you'll find out. They're known by their love and they're known by a pure life. You get over in the book of Revelation, chapter 16. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Revelation 19, 20, then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. And these were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Revelation 20, 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Can't have the Antichrist without a little false prophet going on. You go over to 1 John and the Antichrist is spoken of as a spirit that is in men, that is in the church, that then apostatizes out of the church, meaning leaves the church and disowns the faith. And John says, in 1 John 2, 19, he says, they were, of a, they were with us, but they were not of us. Because if they were of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out from us, that it might be manifest that none of them were of us. Speaking of these antichrists, these, uh, th this spirit that's on these people, it is my belief that the antichrist in the end times will come out of the Christian church. He will be an apostate who will use Christianese with a pluralistic, experience-based religion where Jesus compliments all a number of things as long as it suits him. But ultimately, he wants to run the show and be the owner and the boss, not God. He wants, amen. And so this spirit is in the world. And John says, test these spirits, whether they be of God or not. So let's identify these, these people. Their sphere is in the church. They go to church. They may say the same things you say. They may be self-deceived or they may know what they're doing, but they're ultimately counterfeit and con artists. So their sphere is in the church, not outside, in, among the people. And there will also be false teachers among you. And they're subtle, secondly. They're very subtle. They secretly bring in destructive heresies. The word destructive in the Greek here is used five times in this chapter. It's always damning heresies, meaning it doesn't end well. Peter's going to die. And these people are going to die, but they're going to two different places. And this destruction doesn't mean they just die. It means it's bad when they die. Who secretly bring in destructive, or literally, the word destroy means to be cut off. Things that cut people off from community in the, in the true church. Heresies, and the word heresy in the Greek is the word opinion. These are very opinionated people. They have an opinion about everything. How many of you get on Facebook or multimedia or whatever and everybody's got an opinion about everything? Well, you bring those kind of people into the church and they've just got an opinion about everything. And it doesn't matter if it's in the Bible or not. They can stir it up. But the word also for heresy means sect. And so the, it, it's used of the sect of the Sadducees or the sect of the Pharisees. These are people who are very opinionated. They come into the church that there might be schisms. 
They either want to run the church or they want to get a following in the church for themselves, become a clique, and separate themselves from the church. They're bold, they're assertive, they're opinionated. And they come in secretly and then they get brazen. And it's not Bible that's important to them. It's their opinions of different things and they get people stirred up over opinions and they begin to break the church apart over opinions. Like, what's an opinion? Oh, whether you should wear a mask in church or not. It's not in the Bible anywhere. Oh, who's the president? It's not in the Bible. The Bible was written under Nero, a really bad guy. Like he burned Christians for fun guy, okay? We have opinions about, how many of you know Texans? Come on, somebody, you know what I've just said. I have opinions, glory to God. But my opinion must be heard more than, what does the Bible say? I have feelings. I've had experiences in church. These are very emotional, um, opinionated people. I don't like the worship that way. I'm, I'm, this is not necessarily false prophets, but it's in all of us. I don't like the song they sang today. I don't like that person over there. He gave me a bad look. These opinion, who cares, dude? You get to church because there are some principles in the Bible that say there are things that are non-negotiables. And stop being so negotiable about them. Because of your opinion. So, they're very subtle. And they're very opinionated. And they come in subtly. And they just say, you know, I don't know about this. I don't know about all this over here. And I just, hmm, something in my spirit. They had a little, you know, they're like those Jews over there. Had a little too much pepper on their manna. They just have, they have concerns about Moses. And... and then thirdly, they're not only in the church and they're not only subtle, like a snake in the garden, subtle. Did God really say that? Is that really, that's not the God I serve. He's a God of love. He would never, you're not going to die. There are no consequences. Very subtly, craftily, they come into the church. And they bring in things that are destructive opinions. And these heresies come out of it. And they'll be naming the name of the Lord the whole time they do it. But here it is. This is the telltale sign of a false, a false prophet or teacher. Even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. Even denying or rejecting, in the Greek it is the word to reject. <coughs> Repudiating the Lord. The word Lord in the Greek is not kurios, which is used all over the New Testament, but despotis here. Despot is used 10 times in the New Testament. And it's always used, always. Whenever you see this word, it's going to use servant somewhere in the terminology as well, or slave. And here, Peter calls himself a slave of Christ. Before he's an apostle, he's a slave. But this word despot is used by Zacharias when he sees the Lord Jesus as a baby. And he says, now my master, God, has allowed his servant to see the Messiah. There's a master servant kind of a thing here going on. And whenever this word despot is used in First and Second Timothy and Paul's writings, it's always used of slaves obey your masters for the name of the Lord. So it's a master slave kind of a, a word. And they deny him being their master. They deny that he is boss. He is Lord. They'll preach grace. They'll preach easy believism. All you got to do is punch a card and now you're saved. Oh, you prayed a prayer? Wonderful. Well, we know exactly where your heart is when you did it. 
Do we? And they deny the lordship of Jesus Christ. They have a problem with authority. It says it here later on. It says that they revile authority. They don't like anyone telling them what to do. They're opinionated. And when they preach grace, well, the book of Jude is just a commentary on 2 Peter, right? I mean, it's almost word for word in certain areas. But verse 4 says, certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of God into lasciviousness or loose living, sexual immorality, and they deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. How do they deny Him? They don't do it necessarily with their talk. They do it privately. It's all a, it's all a cover for their private life. Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees because there's nothing hid that's not going to come out in the daylight. What you think you're hiding from God, God's going to put it out in the street. So you better get right with him. It's called the fear of God. But these guys are actors. They play the part and then they go home and live a different way. They're chameleons. The Bible's actually going to call them plastic in verse 3. They can mold into any kind of shape they want. They're plastic Christians. Are we having fun today? I hope you're having a good time. But they're sacrilegious. They honor God with their mouth, but their works deny Him. That's what Paul says to Titus. They profess one thing and they live another. And they do it Ever so long, and then they start to justify it, and it becomes brazen in the church. And now, in America's church, if you believe that, you're, uh, that sex belongs between a man and a woman in a marriage, you're the crazy person. Yes. And we're going to live however we want to, and because our God is love, and everything, everybody gets a trophy. Yeah. <laughs> and there are no consequences, and I'm the boss. Because their ultimate agenda, listen to me, is to own the church. Jesus tells a parable of, of the servants or slaves of the master who every time the master went on a trip, he's sending servants in to see about it and they keep beating those people up. And then he says, I'll send my son and they'll hear him. And the master sends the son and those slaves says, let's kill the son. Let's get him out of the church. And we'll own the whole thing. Yeah. And they want to own the church. They want to run the show. Why? Because it's a big Ponzi scheme. It's greed. I'm going to get into that in a second. They're covetous. They want to exploit you. They don't care about you. They want your money. They want to turn the house of prayer into a den of thieves. Thank God there is a Jesus Christ who knows how to clear house. And he will see to his church. And their judgment does not slumber. God's not dead on the job. Yeah. He'll take care of them. Yes. But because of these people, the gospel and the church is maligned and blasphemed because they see these guys and they say, that's what Christianity is. It's a hoax. It's not real. It's going to say they pounce on new converts. They see people coming in the door and they're like, ah, and somebody's brand new to the faith and so excited about mercy and grace and God and this and that. And they go, isn't that wonderful? And they lead them right into bad stuff. And Peter doesn't mince words about these people. I mean, it's serious what he has to say about them. They're going to go to hell and they go to church. And it's not because they don't believe the right doctrine at some level, as long as it suits them. They deny the master. It has to do with the lordship of Jesus Christ over your life. The word master that bought them, <coughs> agorazo in the Greek, to buy, it's used 25 times in the New Testament. It's used a few times of believing Christians over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 
Paul says, you have been bought with a price, therefore honor God with your body. And you are to be slaves of no one else because you've been bought with a price. Okay? You don't belong to anybody but God. The word agorazo is used in the marketplace. It's used for all kinds of purchases in the New Testament. They went to the market to buy food. Uh, there's land that's being bought. I read it today. I bought some oxen. I bought some land. He bought some fine linen. That's where that came in this morning. But it is a purchase where it goes from seller to buyer. I don't believe that the passage here is saying that Jesus died for the whole wide world and these guys reputed. reputed. It's lit he did not buy a way for them. He bought them. And they deny him. And the idea here, this word in, in the Greek, agorazo, means that they came into the slave market. And this is a different season, okay? This is not America. They came into the slave market. They were slaves. And they were being sold as slaves. And someone came in to that market and bought them from slavery. And this is the word. It went from that man's possession to that man's possession. And Peter is using this concerning these false prophets. They literally have been bought by God as his slaves. You go over to the terminology that Peter uses over in um, Deuteronomy 32.6. And Deuteronomy 32.6 says that the Lord is speaking, you are a crooked and corrupt generation. You are not my children. Although I was a father to you and bought you. And the word despot is used mostly of God the Father throughout the scriptures. It may be loosely affiliated with Christ in the book of Jude. But it's speaking of a sovereign Lord who has full reign and control over somebody's life, who bought somebody out of their situation, out of their circumstances, out of their hardship, and brought them out, and they belong to Him now. See, there's a lot of Christians, they think that when they got saved, that they got freed from God. And now they're their own boss, and that's the exact problem that was happening with the children of Israel. Boy, they were so excited when they were getting bought out of slavery in Egypt. How many of you know, they didn't want to make bricks with no straw and they're so excited and we're going to get out of this place and no more Pharaoh and all of this. And they get outside of Egypt and they get to the Red Sea and now the Egyptians are coming and they're scared and they start complaining against the Lord at the Red Sea. And God brings them to the Red Sea. Now they're all dancing and singing how God did all this stuff. And then just the next story, they start complaining because they come to these bitter water place that God had to do another miracle. And they start complaining and complaining. Why? Because they don't realize they just switched kings. They thought they were just getting bought out of something. They didn't realize that it meant that you, you're signing up for God to be your master for the rest of your life. Over in Exodus chapter 15, verse 16, it says, I, Agarazzo, same word, bought you out of the land of Egypt. That he literally redeemed them. It's not the word for redeem, that's ex Agarazzo, bought out. That's the word mostly used for our redemption. But Agarazzo is, I bought you out of slavery into slavery. You are to be my servant. And there are a lot of people, they come into church and they think, oh, I just punched a card and now God doesn't care how I live because I'm the boss and he's the savior. And I'm going to own the church one day because I got a lot of opinions too, Peter. Sit down, I'll take care of this from here on out. They have an ownership problem. And they've denied the one who pulled them out of some terrible circumstance, out of some situation in life, but when, look, when you become a Christian, there's some people, man, they just want it out of their situation. Somebody help me with my marriage. Somebody help me get the cowboy song to be rewound. Where I get my dog back, I get my house back, I get my wife back, I get my kids back, I get everything back. And that's their Christianity. And so they find preachers who only preach, God's going to make you rich. 
God's going to make you happy. If you just follow God, you'll just be so fulfilled. You get all the money and everything's going to be perfect, peachy keen. And that ain't the Bible. Do you know everybody that wrote the Bible died a martyr's death? Are you kidding me? You get to go to heaven and land well and you get some character out of the deal. But this prosperity message, gospel business, best life now, and everything's just wonderful, and God's just your big gummy bear and just wants you happy, and won't you just want to do it because it's so good? Yeah. And I'm telling you straight up and right now, this stuff is all over America, this Oprah Winfrey business. I'm telling you, it's not the Bible. Right. It's a pluralistic, everybody feel good. Jesus just, <laughs> there's no hell. God didn't even know there were people going there when he made it. <laughs> no, their judgment was long ago decided by God. Long ago when? That's exactly right. Hi, everybody. That's why we don't have a gajillion people church, because I preach the truth. But I'm going to have a people prepared, and nobody's dying on my watch. We're all getting to heaven in one piece in Jesus' name. And that's the plan. Man, when I was little, Lori and I were kissing too much. We're about 15, we're about 15 years old. My youth pastor, Dr. Mike Alexander, says, I know what you're doing. And he reamed me. And I looked at him. I thought, my dad, you were for my dad. My dad was the pastor. And then I, and then I kind of liked it. I said, this guy doesn't care if he burns the whole house down over truth. And I said, he just loved on me. And I said, that's the kind of preacher I'm going to be, man. I burned the house down with truth. I don't care. We start all over. I'm going to believe the word of God and preach it. And I don't care where it lands. Glory to God. And so I'm loving on you today is all I'm trying to say. Just loving on you. Some people don't like that kind of love. Because it means there's a standard. And it's not them. Mr. Narcissistic. <laughs> Master of your destiny and Jesus is your savior. Yeah, yeah. Jesus did not come to compliment you. He came to spit in your face and open your eyes to the reality that there is a God and you're not it. Right. And it's rude. Because the Pharisees want to own everything and the Sadducees and this upstart shows up and says he's king. Very usurping this gospel. It will change your life forever and you may lose everything. See, people want God as long as he bails them out of their situation. And there's a lot of people happy to follow that God. This guy wants me happy. It's when they get into the desert and they start getting tested and they lose friendships over their faith. And not everybody agrees. Not everybody's nice to them and things start going south and they've got to swear their own hurt and not change over certain issues. And there's no quick fix to their situation. See, we're in a Christianity where there's a quick fix to everything. There's a quick happy meal, miracles all the time. You go back to the Puritans, you go back to the people who built this country and they understood endurance and they understood that there's hardship and there's testing and there's trials and God's looking for friends. That aren't fair weather. He's looking for Job's up in the house again. When he takes everything from you and he's still enough. God pulls these guys out of the marketplace of whatever they were enslaved to. Brings them into the house of God. They start getting established and they deny the master that did it all. How do they deny him? I believe they deny him by... Writing a self-help book about how I got out of Egypt. Y'all yeah. yeah. having fun today? I sure am. <laughs> Hallelujah. How? The 10 steps to getting out of Egypt. Step number one, get some hail. Step number two, get some frogs. <laughs> Throw them at people. Do you know what God delivered you from? And for you to say it was my own hand and my own power that did it. I deny the one who pulled me out in the first place. I love how you become the center of everything. Man-centered baloney. Now God, you were chained to sin and God came and pulled you out of it. And said, you're going to work for me now. 
How many of you know that's the truth? That's the truth. You were as chained to your own lifestyle and your own sin. And I'll say this as well. You weren't just chained to the devil. You were chained to yourself. Of all the problems in your life, you're the biggest one. He came to save you from you. Because the problem in the desert wasn't Pharaoh. It was them. So that's one way you deny the master who bought you. So God's looking for people who won't repudiate the master. Who pulled them out of stuff. God's looking for a church that will praise him in the midnight hour. God's looking for a church that will love God when it's hard. Because they realize that the program is that he's delivering them from their sin and not from some circumstance. Sometimes he uses a crooked path to get you to where you need to be. But at the end of the day, you smell like a rose. And you're God's best. At the end of the day, you cannot look at your past to define you. You must trust that the Lord is using it all to make you who you're called to be. Because you're more important than your past. And what does it gain you if you have the whole world given to you and you lose your soul? If you get that old, if you get all of Washington State and their beautifulnesses, if you become the president of whatever... And you lose your connection with God and your soul. What is that at the end of the day? I don't believe here that he is speaking of people who've lost their salvation. In the sense that they were regenerate, born again Christians who lost it. That seems like a very broad stroke. Saying, look, I'm not talking about people who've been faking it the whole time. Just about these kinds of people. I don't believe that's what he's saying. Because Jesus said, beware of these people. Who come one way. They look very close to the real. He says, but I say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. He didn't say, it's like we never knew each other, bro. I mean, we had some good times and then you, it's just like I don't even know who you are anymore. It's not what he's saying there. He's saying, I, never, I was never intimate with you. I don't believe Judas was ever saved. He was chosen and yet a devil. And Jesus knew it and brought him in. Because he's cool like that. I mean, he's in control. These people come into the church as judgment against a bunch of carnal people who want a Jesus that strokes their ego. There's a lot of narcissism in the church and God judges it with false teachers that he raises up in the church. I don't believe that these are saved people because of the description that Peter gives. He says they're pseudo from the beginning. They're pseudo. And because there's no fruit anywhere in this chapter. They're cursed children. Jude says they have not the spirit. And at the end of this chapter it says, so the proverb is true. The dog returns to its own vomit and the soul having washed to wallowing in the mire. They come in, they have an outward reformation, but there's no inward change. They're still a dog. They're still a so. I bank on the inward life. I bank on the root system that is beneath the surface. As to know whether it's good ground or rocky ground or thorny ground. It's what's underneath that Peter is exposing here. So I believe, yes, they were bought. Master slave, brought in, bought and redeemed, but he coins the phrase that's used of the pro false prophets in the wilderness. And I don't believe all of those were regenerate people. I think they all got out, but a lot of them were as fleshly as could be and started complaining the first chance they got. I also say, Algarizo, when it's used of Christians, it's always bought with a price or bought by the blood. And here it's not that. It's master, slave. These people were called into service and they rebelled against it. Because they didn't sign up for it. So their sphere is among the people. They are subtle, they are sacrilegious, and they're successful. Let's look at that. Verse 2. And many will follow their destructive ways. 
The word destructive in the Greek is sensual. A sensuality that destroys lives. And brothers and sisters, I'm not asking you to be perfect. I just don't want you a Judas at the end of the day. I don't want you kissing Jesus and betraying him at the same time. And because of the way of truth, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. They are successful at their job. They go after unsuspecting people, new Christians or people that aren't Christians, and they look to pounce on them when they come through the door. That's what he's going to talk about. People that barely escaped this world in the church. They're experiencing the blessings of God. They go after those people who have not handled the world, the word long enough to know the difference. And so God's called some of us to shepherd the flock. They're successful. Fifthly, their state of is that they're sensual. They have a state of sensuality about them. They are visually stimulating or trying to. They're trying to show off. They're the blingers of Christianity. They love the bling bling and the bells and whistles and the smoke machines and the guitar riffs and the they live for it. It's all plastic. It's all extra. It's all GQ'd out and all that stuff. And I don't mean that you don't want to smell good coming to church. Please, everybody smell good. But there's a little bit of a sensualness of them. And they're not spirit filled. They appeal to sensualness. And because of them, the way of truth is blasphemed by the world. Do you all remember the story of, uh, very quickly, of uh, Phineas and Hophni over in 1 Samuel chapter 2? Phineas and Hophni were Eli's sons. And Phineas and Hophni were priests in the house of God. Eli was the head priest and he was one of the last judges of Israel before Samuel and then the kings came. But it says that Phineas and Hophni did not know the Lord. But they were nepotismed up into the priesthood. And Eli would not chasten his sons when he saw them sinning. What would they do? The Bible says that when people would bring offerings to the Lord, they'd get their servant out there to say, you're going to give me all your offering or I'll take it by force. And these guys were real jerks. And they were the priests, the teaching priests of the church. And they did not know the Lord. And it said, because of them, the offering of the Lord was abhorred in those days. It's like people taking two-hour offerings at church to the point where you never want to give to the church ever again. Because you're like, those people are a bunch of thieves. This is a big racket, and you might be right for a lot of it. And it says that they slept with everybody. They slept with the women at the doors of the temple. I mean, they were just brazen. And the prophet came along and said, I'm going to kill your, the Lord says, I'm going to kill your kids. I'm taking them out. They're done. He says, I'm going to raise up a prophet in their place who will hear my voice and go after my heart. He's talking about Samuel. And Phineas and Hophni go to battle against the Philistines. Y'all know the story? And they take the ark of the Lord with them and they're saying all the right things and they got the ark. And they raise up a shout that shakes the ground, the Bible says, and scare the Philistines. But they go out the first time and 4,000 of the Israelites die in that battle because these guys couldn't get their act together as leaders. They go back out the second time and 30,000 Israelites die in the second battle. And the ark is taken and Phineas and Hophni die in battle. And when word comes back that they are dead, nothing happens to Eli. But when word comes back that the ark had been taken, he falls over backwards and breaks his neck and dies. And then I can't remember which one of their wives was having a baby. I'd have to look it up. But the wife of one of those boys, or those brothers, is dying in childbirth, and she names the kid Ichabod. The glory has departed from Israel. 
And these guys are always going to be in the church. They're called to service. They don't understand he's the master. They repudiate that because of their experiences and opinions. And by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. That word deceptive is plastic, fabricated. They make up anything. And for a long time, their judgment has not been idle. Their destruction does not slumber. And what Peter is saying is, some people go, why doesn't God judge these people? And they're also going to ask, why is he delaying his coming? And he's going to say, God is not asleep on the job. He's got the perfect time marked out for them. And Paul says they will not make further progress, but their folly will be manifest to all. We see people on national television acting like crazy people that are big time preachers. And I'm not saying they're not saved. I don't know that in person. And I pray God's mercy on them. But I do know that there's a bunch of those in this Bible. And there's nothing new under the sun. And God is looking for people not to cast stones all the time, but to separate yourself from ministries that get away from the Bible, preach personality, stroke your testimony more than they point you to God and say it's time to repent of your sins and to live for Him and not yourself. You are His slave. One last thing. I think the reason that a lot of these guys are bad slaves of God is because everybody is. There's, how many of you know all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? That's right. And I think there's not one person in this room that's done a bang up job. I don't think you can be a good slave until you understand that you are a child of God. Jesus says in John chapter 6, y'all stay with me for one more minute. In John chapter 8, in John chapter 8, he says, those that continue in my word are my disciples indeed. And they will know the truth and the truth shall make them free. Do y'all remember that? And then the Jews that were with him said, make us free. We've not been in bondage to anyone we're children of Abraham. That's right. They think they're not in bondage anyway, including God. We're children of Abraham. And Jesus says, he who ever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the master's house forever. But a son abides forever. And whoever the son sets free is free indeed. I think these guys have no grace. I think there are also a bunch of legalists. They're trying to be slaves and they never realize that they've got to start by being sons. Do you remember the story over in Luke chapter 15 where the prodigal son comes home and he says, I'm not worthy to be your son. I've wasted all your inheritance. Just make me one of your slaves. And the father runs to him, puts his arms around him, throws the big feast for him. And the son that was slave first, son second, is over outside of the party saying this guy wasted everything he's not a good slave in order to be a good slave you got to be a good son Jesus is not an angel who came to make you an angel he is the son of God who came to make you a child of God and a son abides forever whereas slaves don't stick around very long God has called you to know him as Lord but also to know him as Savior You need well-educated faith to tell you, look, you're not signing up to go live however you want. There is a surrender. There is a turning your life over to His Lordship and saying, you take it from here, I'm done trying. I just want a happy ending. There was a thief on the cross and he said, if you're Jesus, get us out of this mess. If you're who they say you are, get us down from here. And the other one said, we deserve this. 
But this man's innocent. And he said, Lord, remember me on the other side of this mess. And Jesus answered that prayer. He gave that man a happy ending to his process. And Jesus takes tragedies and he turns them into miracles. And God will stay with you like moss on a tree until you start to look like his son. And that is the Savior. That's what he's saving you from. He's not saving you to be Lady Liberty, go do what you want. He's freeing you from your own self-destruction. He's freeing you from your own sin and sinful patterns. And he is delivering you from the sin factory itself. You. He jumps on the inside of you and works it out. To will and to do of his good pleasure. It's called the new birth. Some of you are going, how am I ever going to be good enough? When you start reading this kind of stuff, you go, well, that sounds a lot like what my life has been like. But how many of you know God's pulled you out time and time again? He just wants all the credit, you guys. Somebody say amen. He doesn't want you saying, look what I did with all that. Don't you deny the master that bought you. Pulled you out. So you're going to be my servant and you're going to serve me all the days of your life. And it's going to be about my glory and not your glory. And I'm also going to make you a child and you're going and I'll save you when you fall. You say, how do you know that, John? Let me tell you one last thing. They denied the master. That word deny is the same word that's used of Peter when he denied Jesus three times. Yeah. Same word in the Greek. Deny, deny, deny. The one who denied him epically failed. But he had a Savior who prayed for his faith that it would not fail. I'm even glad that Jesus has carried the day for you time and time again. And he could have quit on you how many times before, but he just keeps on keeping on. And you've trusted, you've entrusted your soul to him and he's the hope of your life. Is that true? Amen. Amen. You, he's, he's your anchor. You need him as Lord and you need him as Savior. And that's who you trust in. And submit your life to. And it's not always easy. Because it's not buddy grace. It's paternal. He's growing you up. And it's not always fun. But he's not going to have a bunch of brats who love streets of gold more than him when they get there. Is that all right today? Did you, did you understand what I said? Did it make any kind of sense? Of all your relationships, he's the one non-negotiable. You've got to have. God is looking for some principled past people in the church. Everything else is negotiable. But your relationship with God is non-negotiable. Jesus Christ in your life is a non-negotiable item. You hear me? Yes. You brush yourself off. You get the mercy that you need because you're going to need it. And you beg God, please don't let me be one of them. Yes. By your mercy, don't let me end up there. Well, we'll continue this talk next week. That's the sketch of these people, and then we'll unpackage it. And I pray that you keep coming back. I don't mean to run y'all off with hard preaching like this. I wanted to read, I wanted to read the love chapter today. Love is patient, love is kind, we is good. I I I want to read those kind of things, and we can all laugh and dance and sing. But listen to me. I don't want you to be a venomous snake. I just want you to be as wise as one. And as harmless as a dove because of what God has done in your life. Let's be gentle. Let's be caring. Let's pray for our leaders. Let's believe the best about what God is doing. He said these words, upon this rock I'll build my church. And the gates of perdition and hell will not prevail against it. We have confidence that the Lord is doing that still. And these guys that deny the master that bought them, they're like, well, what happened to me was I had to hit rock bottom. And that brother just hadn't hit rock bottom yet like I hit rock bottom. But well, they're digging through their own sand to get down to the rock that's somewhere down inside of them. I'd rather you look to the rock than go dig for one. 
inside of yourself. And upon this rock, he'll build his church. That's what Peter said, coming to him, the living stone. And you can build your life on him. Oh God, that his sheep would have ears to hear his voice. Let's all stand up this morning. I want to be encouraged, Lord. I want the church to be encouraged. I want the church to be strengthened. I don't want us to be all political and opinionated to the point where we can't love each other and do church because of what the Bible says. But Lord, there's an element of wisdom that you're calling the church to grow up in in these hours. There has been a drift away from your word. There has been an, a liberal agenda to attack the veracity of Scripture in its plain sense and, and redundancies where you say the same thing over and over, cover to cover, and people still looking at you. And I pray, Lord God, for a church that would bow the knee to your Scriptures yes. and to realize that they have fathers in the faith that are speaking into their life through this holy book. And Lord Jesus, you're using it all as a tool because you put an anointing on your people. Let us not be deceived in these days. And let us not become plastic for the sake of money, for the urgency of the now, out of the fear of man and wanting to be liked. God, help us to honor you with our life. Help this church to be a friend of God. And if it costs us everything, Lord Jesus, deliver me from a Judas spirit. I don't want to be a Judas to my wife, to my kids, to my Lord. I don't want to be one of his disciples. Always happy to be along until it got hard and you started preaching suffering. And that's when Judas split. God help me not to be that way. God help me to be a soldier who fights for my family and for your church and for the lives of those that are in need. And Lord, I pray today over your church that we would love each other more than money. And we care about your flock more than being a hireling, yes. a thief. You can't serve money and God. God, help me to love you more than I do money as a pastor of this church. And God, let this church be a house of prayer over a den of thieves with a bunch of con artists, God, I pray. How many of you just say today, John, I repent where I've tried to be master over my own life. And maybe this week you've sinned and you just say, John, I need God's mercy on my life today. Can I just see your hand today? Just say, I need God's mercy. I need God's mercy for my walk. I need God's mercy. I want him as my Lord because only he can make sure heaven happens for me. And I need to know that my life has a happy ending. And I repent today of living a life away from him. And I need his mercy. And Father, I pray the mercy of God on this church in every heart. I pray mercy on marriages. I pray mercy on children. I pray mercy on brokenness. Mercy on it all, Lord God. And I pray that you make sons out of slaves. And you make slaves out of sons. And Lord, that we serve you well, knowing that we get the inheritance that is you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. That's all I had to say today. Let's praise the Lord one more time today. Come on. We love you, Lord. All right, go eat potluck. I love you all. If you need prayer, come on up to the front today. God bless you. Amen.